Hello, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold to Hope. And this is our regular weekly message entitled, Fear Not. With all the chaos and unsettledness and the fear mongering that's going on in our world today and, and throughout the world's media, I feel we need to be reminded of what God said to Joshua. We also need to be reminded that he not only said that to Joshua, but he also said it to us. He said, fear not. So turn with me, please, to Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God, in all of his providence, has said, do not be afraid. But I want you to, to look just a little bit closer. He didn't just say it, but he commanded it. Verse 9 says, have I not commanded you? God is very, very serious about fear. But why so serious, God? There are three mean reasons why. And so we're going to have a three-point message today instead of my usual one point. First point is a form of weakness. Fear is a form of weakness that leads to mistrust. Look with me at Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 again. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee wheresoever thou goest. God says, be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. Do not be frightened about anything. Nothing that comes up against you should you be afraid of because I am with you wherever you go. It doesn't matter where you go in life. God is right there next to you. He is not far away. He's not some, some far away God that, that, that's, that, that has created us and then went off somewhere and left us alone. No, God is near us. God is with us. Emmanuel, God with us. You see, because fear is the opposite of, uh, of faith. Therefore, God says, eradicate fear from your life because you are to operate in faith, not fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. Make no mistake, weakness is stemmed from mistrust. And mistrust comes from fear. You cannot trust someone and fear the results of their decision. You've seen it over and over and over in the movies. The man holds out his hand and says to the woman, do you trust me? And she usually says yes, or she will just place her hand in his hand. And they both jump off of some high building or some, some high place. And they either land safely on the ground or they land safely on something. Or maybe they, they even land safely on some flying magic carpet but they're always safe. Well, that is the same concept. God is holding out his great and mighty hand to us. And he is saying, do you trust me? If we show fear, we are in essence saying, no, I do not trust you. A statement that, takes, that, that God takes very personal. Why personal? Because when you say when you mistrust God or you say that, that, that you're afraid, that means you do not trust God any longer, that he could deliver you, and that therefore you are now calling God a liar because God said, I am with you wherever you go. I will protect you. No one is able to take you out of my hand. It doesn't matter where the, uh, they, they, they persecute us. We know that God is for us and not against us. He is saying, trust me, child. Trust me. We are in a spiritual war, a battle for the souls of men. If we show the slightest hint 
of fear, we show, the, the, we show weakness. And when we show weakness, the enemy will swoop in and not only eat our lunch, but he will take tomorrow's lunch money as well. He will strip you of everything that you have and he will leave you broke and naked. And God knows that. So that is why he said in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 6, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. God just takes it for granted that we can somehow comprehend even just a small part of his great and awesome power of who he is. He is the great and omniscient God. He is um, omnipresent, om omnipotent. He is mighty, mighty, mighty. Nothing is too hard for God. Just think about it. God spoke and everything you see came into being. Let there be light. And there was light. You try doing that. And you'll see how difficult it is for you. But for God, he just spoke it. Let there be light. And there was light. So if we could just get a small understanding of the concept of how much we mean to God and how much he loves us and how powerful he is, there'll be no stopping us. If only we can but get a hold of that concept, we will have complete boldness. We will have complete confidence. We would be fearless even in the face of death. Fear is not of God. God did not give us a spirit of fear. Fear is from the devil. Paul said in 2, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I want to camp out here for just a few minutes. And I want to consider Three sub points about the verse that we just read. You see, we cannot operate in power when we walk in fear because you cannot cast out and you cannot drive out that which you are afraid of. You will run from that which you fear, just like the Israelites ran from Goliath because they feared him greatly. I remember several years back. We were visiting someone in, in their home, and the owner of that house was seeing three black forms with long, scraggly black hair. My wife also saw the apparitions. Not long after our visit, the owner of the house actually died inside the house. I went back to the house, and I was praying, and I was worshiping in the house all day. I was by myself. I was worshiping and praying. And when evening came, the night started to come on and the shadows began to lengthen and the sun went down and darkness began to creep around the house. And I heard a voice, not an audible voice, but I heard it in my mind. And it was very, very clear to me. And it said, the night is coming. Soon it will be dark and he is coming. If he finds you here, they will have to carry you out. Also, I'm not going to lie to you. It shook me up a little bit. Okay. It shook me up a lot. But in defiance of that voice, I stayed right where I was about another 30 or 40 seconds. Maybe a little less. Maybe I stayed there another 20 seconds. Then I got out of there. I have to admit, the, the hair on the back of my neck started to stand up on end. I felt like all of my exits was, was beginning to be blocked. I felt like, like a, a strangulation hole was starting to come over me, and, and soon there was going to be no way for me to get out. And in that moment, without even thinking about it, I second-guessed God's coming to my defense. I forgot about his great and omnipotent power, the power that he gave us to cast out demonic spirits. You see, 
You cannot cast out or drive out that which you fear. Fear is a form of weakness that leads to distrust. Trust God. He will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. The second sub-point is love. We cannot operate in power when we walk in fear. Likewise, we cannot operate in fear if we walk in love. Look with me at 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. They will know us by our love because we love each other, because we love others, because we even love those who hate us, those who say all manner of evil against us, even those who plot our demise, we are to love. We are to show love in all situations. When people rail up against us, we, do, we don't return railing for railing. We do not return cursing for cursing. But when they curse, we bless. When they hate, we love. We love even in the harshest um, climates, even in the harshest of times. We must love. And the last point of the subpoints is this, a sound mind. He has given us a sound mind. Now, this word that's translated sound mind is the Greek word sophronismos. And according to the theological dictionary of the New Testament, this word is found only from the imperial period, meaning making to understand, making wise, Inasmuch as understanding is the basis of virtue and an upright life. It also means admonition to do better. More rarely, it can mean discretion in the sense of moderation and discipline. In other words, God has given us this spirit of self-discipline with an implication that this discipline demonstrates prudence and wisdom, wisdom according to Greek English dictionary. We are no longer free to act in our own ways. We are no longer free to act however we want. We are no longer free to act in our own man ways. We are no longer free to react to things that annoy us, things that make us angry, things that make us upset. We have a holy protocol to follow. We are to react in a Christ-like manner. Number two of our main points. Fear leads to defeat. Fear will keep you from what God has for you. Remember, when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, God opened up the Red Sea and they all passed through on dry ground. But when the Egyptians who were chasing them and was getting close, they, when they tried to do it, the sea closed back in on them and they all drowned. Then these Israelites saw all of that. They saw the, the, the Egyptians floating. The chariots destroyed. The horses all dead. Then they got, they got to the Jordan. And Moses sent 12 spies over to search out the land, to spy out the land. And when they returned, they returned with a bad report. And this is where they're at now. They're, they're, they're in the setting. And they're explaining to the whole Israelite tribe of what they saw there. And they're bringing this bad report. So let's pick it up. Numbers chapter 13, verse 30 through 33. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a 
bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to, to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seem to them. God had just told these people to go into the land, take control of the land, occupy the land, because he was giving it to them as an inheritance. But the spies who went into the land to spy it out, they brought back a bad report. Every single one of them, except for Caleb and Joshua, they had returned with fear in their hearts because they saw the Nephilim. And it began to spread this fear throughout the whole community. And it spread to every one of the Israelites. And they too became afraid. And they were too afraid to go into the land to take the possession of that land that God had promised them on oath from, from the time of Abraham, their, their, their um, ancestor. He promised them that he would give them this land. And this was the time. He was not going to leave them and forsake them. Mind you, they just came out of Egypt. They were delivered from the land of slavery through a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. This is God Almighty who delivered them. He, he, he had just performed judgment on Egypt. He had just pronounced judgment on Egypt's gods. He had just performed the ten plagues. And he delivered them out of the land of slavery. They had gotten to the Red Sea. The Egyptians was coming up behind them with horses and chariots and warriors and soldiers and spears. And there was no way to go. What did God do? Did he leave them? No. He opened up the Red Sea for them and it passed through on dry ground. The, 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 the scripture says... Dry ground, not damp ground, dry ground. Meaning that when they walked through, it was they were slushing through water. They were walking and dust was coming off of their feet. Dry ground. When they reached the other side, the Egyptians entered in and they're marching through and they're, they're, they're flying through to, to, to capture these Israelites and bring them back and put them back forcefully in slavery. What did God do? He told Moses, stretch out your rod over the sea. And it closed in on them and drowned Pharaoh's army. Now they come to the land of promise. And they see the sons of Anak. They see the Nephilim. And what do they do? They fill their hearts with fear. Knowing all of the stuff that they just saw, all of those miracles, the deliverance of God. And yet they fear. And then they place fear in the hearts of their fellow Israelites. Therefore, that is why fear leads to defeat. Even before you start, fear will lead to defeat. Look at it. Not one arrow flew. Not one sword was drawn. Not one rock flew from a sling, but they were already defeated because they were defeated in their hearts. What is happening right now in our world is the unleashing of fear. It is being used as a weapon. Not only as a weapon, but it's a, it's a tool that they're using to keep people, keep the whole world compliant, keep the whole world agreeable with the plans that they have made for us. The fear of COVID-19 has caused the whole world to go into lockdown. It has caused the taxpayers billions and billions of dollars. Multiplied hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of businesses around the world has closed because of these lockdowns. People's personal money, their life savings that were wrapped up in a business was wiped out, completely wiped out and taken away from them. Their inheritance, their children's inheritance was taken away because of fear. It seems to be little doubt to me that COVID-19 was created in a lab. But 
as you notice, no one is being charged with crimes against humanity. Real helpful treatments are being suppressed, are being locked down. Videos are being taken down in favor, and everyone is going in favor of promoting a treatment that is potentially dangerous. And those who are taking it are still ended up with COVID. And even some of those are dying from COVID, even with the vaccine. And what's even worse, some are dying from the vaccine itself. The same vaccine that is supposed to have inoculated them from that virus. There are countless of stories of people dying cause COVID-19 died from something else. Doing this grossly inflates the statistics causing the population to have skewed or wrong statistics and, and, and fear now begins to seep in. Fear begins to take grip of their hearts and even panic begins to set in. When fear and panic set in on the people, the people who fear and panic are controlled and they willingly submit. They willingly give up rights. They willingly submit to whatever is presented to them, even to their own demise. I had a customer tell me that a family member of his was feeling sick. And when he went to the hospital, went to the doctor, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Shortly afterward, he died, apparently from cancer. Cause of death on the certificate, COVID-19. Like I said, inflating the statistics of death caused by COVID-19 opens the door to the spirit of fear to come in, swirl around hearts, and cause people to make decisions without proper thought and without proper advice. Not only will fear lead to defeat, but it will lead to compromise. And that's our third point. Fear leads to compromise. What fear does is to whisper in the minds of its victim, you better hurry before it's too late. If you don't hurry, you will die. You don't have time to think about this. You don't have time to consider this. Just do it and do it quickly. If you don't do it now, you will be next. You will be the next one dead. Fear is probably the number one killer of dreams with procrastination a close second. But it seems to me like procrastination is by far and large a, 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 um, a, a cause by fear. Fear causes procrastination. Fear of failure. Fear of doing something wrong. Fear of not knowing what to do next. Fear of fear. Fear will lead you to compromise even though you know it is wrong. Even though you know that something isn't right, fear will still lead you to compromise what you know is right. Fear will tell you that it really isn't wrong or they'll tell you there is no other way. This is the only way. It is fear that keeps women bound in polygamous marriages. They are too afraid to escape and rightly so. The same is true for women and children caught in sex slave industry. They're so broken and harshly terrorized that they are too intimidated to even consider escaping. And it's a real thing. It's a real danger. They fear for their own lives and they fear for the lives of their loved ones. These are some of the reasons why whenever the angel of God appeared or some heavenly messenger appeared or even when Jesus appeared after the resurrection, they always prefix their message with, fear not, do not be afraid. Even before his death, when Jesus came walking out on the water, when he sent his disciples across to, to, 
to the other side and he stayed back after feeding the 5,000 and he was praying. He came out to his disciples in the middle of the night walking on the water. They were in the middle of a storm in the middle of the lake and the wind was contrary and the wind blowing the boat to and fro and the wind is, is uh, and, and the water's crashing over the bow of the boat and they think they're gone about to drown and they see the form walking on the water and they begin to cry out because they believe that it's a ghost and Jesus said fear not it is I when fear leads you to compromise you lose did you know extreme fear will lead to health issues that, I guess, is another reason why there is so much fear not warnings in the Bible. So I want to leave you with five ways to overcome fear. Because apparently a study found, found this, and I want to quote, scientists scanned the brains of 264 random men and women in a recent study. They then had the subjects fill out a questionnaire to de determine whether they were procrastinators or doers. They found that the subjects who struggled with procrastination had a larger amygdala than the, than the doers. The amygdala is the control center for fear and emotion, meaning procrastinators aren't lazy and unambitious as many assume, but rather fear can immobilize them when it comes time to initiate a new task. In fact, a larger amygdala is linked to more anxiety in both children and adults. The larger the amygdala, the greater the anxiety. End of quote. So with that said, number one, pray for guidance first. Before you do anything, pray for guidance. Then make comprehensive, detailed plans. After you finish your comprehensive plans as required, then just do it. Don't go back and second think yourself. Do not go back and, and, and revisit things. Do a comprehensive plan. Pray, then do a cons comprehensive plan and do it. Just do it. Do not let those voices in your head talk to you and, and talk you out of doing what it is that you know that you need to do. Speak over all of those voices, all the noise in your head, and remind yourself what Edison said. I did not fail. I just found 10,000 ways that didn't work. Number two, create a new mindset by getting a new perspective. Far too often, people will focus on the negative and overlook the positive. They will see the lemons and blank on the lemonade. God is your helper. Focus on him. He is the mountain mover. So don't focus on the mountain itself. Focus on the one who moves the mountain for you. He is the great I am and he is with you. Second Corinthians chapter 10 Verse 5 says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. But how? By, by being transformed by the renewal of your mind, as, God, uh, as Paul said in, um, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. But how do we do that? By employing... Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about it. Think about the, the, the positive things and let the positive things override the negative things. Jesus said that we are more than conquerors. 
And conquerors do not fail. Because God is for us. Who or what can be against us? Therefore, we must cast down every thought that does not line up with the word of God. Now, we must be sure, though, that we are lining up ourselves, lining up with the word of God, and not with our own selfish ambitions. And that goes back to step one. Pray for guidance. Because sometimes... Well, the Bible says that we have not because we ask not. And when we ask, sometimes we ask amiss. We, we, we ask for the wrong reasons. We ask to, to satisfy our own selfish desires. Number three, get around successful, knowledgeable, encouraging people. Just like fear can sweep through the camp like wildfire, positiveness can be caught as well. And that too can, can, can sweep through. It can encourage people. Just a smile can encourage someone. So get around positive, successful people. Read positive, successful books. Philippians chapter 4 verse 9 says, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So learn. Get good self-help tips. Read good self-help books. Especially the Christian ones. Listen to motivational speakers. Especially the Christian ones. Number four. Build your faith. Romans chapter 10 verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You must set aside a time and a place to read and study your Bible. You have to read and study your Bible every single day. You cannot form a relationship with your Heavenly Father. You cannot form a relationship with Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, if you do not know who He is and He reveals Himself through His Word. So if you're not reading His Word, you are you're not getting a communication with your Heavenly Father. You have to read his word. You have to study his word. Read or listen to God's word. But hopefully you will take out your Bible, dust it off and read it. Because the eyes are the gateway to your soul. Let it seep through you. It's, the Bible says, says, Jesus says that if your eyes are dark, how dark is your soul? How dark is your inside? Light it up with the light of God, his word. Number five. And this last one, number five, is so simple. It's plainly just get enough rest. Get enough sleep. Too little sleep, too little rest will, will um, make you anxious. It'll, it'll make you um, even panic. It can cause panic attacks. Get enough sleep. Get enough rest. So in closing, let me just remind you that fear will keep you from reaching your goals. It'll keep you from reaching your full potential. It will keep you from reaching or succeeding in your dreams. Because fear is a tyrant. Fear is a deceiver. Fear is a liar. And our three points was this. Fear is a form of weakness. Fear leads to defeat. Fear leads to compromise. I read this on, on the internet. Fear is nothing more than false evidence appearing real. So believe God, trust Jesus, love people, and the spirit of truth will be with you. You will overcome that spirit of fear. Now, I want to ask you this question. Do you know Jesus, the spirit of truth? Do you know our heavenly father? If you do not know who Jesus is, he died for you. 2,000 years ago, 
he was crucified. And the scripture says that he was wounded for his transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. So, peace. He bought us peace. Peace is no fear. So, whatever comes around, whatever happens, we have peace because we know whom we have believed. We know where we are going. Do you know where you're going? Do you know where you'll spend eternity? If you don't, you can. Jesus said, whoever asks will receive. So let us ask today. Let us ask for forgiveness. Follow me in this prayer. Father, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me, O Lord God. Cleanse me of my iniquities. Rebuke that spirit of fear. Give me boldness and confidence. Help me to live for you. Help me not to shrink back, but to be bold. I ask you, O oh Lord God, to lead me in all paths of righteousness. And I'll give you thanks, and I give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, what I want you to do is to buy yourself a Bible or take down the old family Bible and dust it off and open it up and read. Read your Bible every day. Get a highlighter and highlight those verses that are meaningful to you. Highlight those promises. Jesus will fulfill everything every promise that he makes. So commit all of this to heart. Commit it to heart. And so that when you're struggling, when you're going through a hard time, when the spirit of fear tries to come upon you, you can say, I am a child of God. Use scripture. Now the next thing I want you to do is to find yourself a Bible-believing church. A Bible-believing church who still believes in the power of Almighty God, who still believes in righteousness, who still believes in holiness, who still believes that there is a right way and a wrong way. Not one of those progressive churches who have compromised the Word of God, but believe that God is who He said He was, for He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. Be active in that church. And when God comes back, when Jesus comes back to get his people, he will find you doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing, what he has commanded you to do. And he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter in and you will be with him forever and ever and ever. What a glorious day that will be. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. My name's Kenny Yates. This is Hold to Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.